A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as he usually did. He stood up to read, and they handed him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord has been given to me, for he has anointed me. He has sent me to bring the good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to captives, and to the blind new sight, to set the downtrodden free, to proclaim the Lord's year of favor. He then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the assistant, and sat down. And all eyes in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to speak to them. This text is being fulfilled today, even as you listen. And he won the approval of all. And they were astonished by the gracious words that came from his lips. They said, this is Joseph's son, surely. But he replied, no doubt you will quote me the saying, physician, heal yourself. And tell me, we have heard all that happened in Capernaum. Do the same here in your own countryside. And he went on. I tell you solemnly, no prophet is ever accepted in his own country. There were many widows in Israel, I can assure you, in Elijah's day, when heaven remained shut for three years and six months, and a great famine raged throughout the land. But Elijah was not sent to any one of these he was sent to a widow at Zarephath, a Sidonian town. And in the prophet Elisha's that time, there were many lepers in Israel, but none of these was cured except the Syrian Naaman. When they heard this, everyone in the synagogue was enraged. They sprang to their feet and hustled him out of the town. And they took him up to the brow of a hill their town was built on, intending to throw him down the cliff, but he slipped through the crowd and walked away. The Gospel of the Lord. The Gospel we just listened to from Luke chapter 4, which describes the inauguration of the public ministry of Jesus in Luke's account is popularly called by very many biblical exegetes, as scholars who interpret the scriptures, as the manifesto of Jesus. I and many people are usually not comfortable with that interpretation, not because it is wrong, it is certainly not, but because of how we know manifestos. That is a very common word that usually is in vogue during election seasons. When many politicians are vying for political offices and they want one position or the other, and they are canvassing for votes from the populace, usually they gather people and they give what is called a manifesto. And what we know from experience is that many of these manifestos are never honored. So people just lie to us to make us vote for them. So when people come with manifestos, we usually don't take them serious. So when Bible scholars say Jesus is giving a manifesto now, it makes us somewhat uncomfortable because we think it's a manifesto like the others. And that's where we get it wrong. A manifesto, it's like a thesis statement a description of what is about to be done. While we may not trust politicians to be true to their word, Jesus is hologos, the word. That's how John's gospel introduces Jesus. In the beginning was the word, not a word. So politicians have their words. This one has a word. This one has a word, this one has a word, so we put them together, they become words. That's why at the end of reading City Church, we don't say the words of the Lord. 
because we literally altered many words. We should expect it to be rendered in plural, but we don't say the words of the Lord. We say the word of the Lord. Jesus is the word, Paul Logos, in substantive singular, meaning that there's no possibility of alteration. There's no possibility of change. And that's why the Catechism of the Catholic Church says we must trust everything that the Lord has said because he can neither deceive nor be deceived. What he has said is definitive. His word, the scripture says, is yes and amen. And that's why he says those who follow him, their word should be, if it's yes, it should be yes, and if it's no, it should be no. It should not be in between. Christians should not be sitting on the fence. The book of Revelation says if we are neither hot nor cold, the Lord spits us out of his mouth. So we should not approach the word of the Lord from our understanding of the words of men. So while men's manifestos wantingly fail, the manifesto of the Lord cannot fail. The scripture says, the truth of the Lord stands firm forever. This was the point that the king's folk of Jesus missed. And it's even more sad because they were at a very dire moment of their lives when they needed to hear what Jesus had to say. They have been waiting for the Messiahs, or what we simply in English call the Messiah. They are at a very critical stage in their history, where all is dark and dreary. They have been yearning in a perpetual advent, expecting the coming of the promised one of the Lord. And the Lord comes. You would expect that they will be excited to receive him, but they are not able to identify him. That's why John's prologue says he came to his own, but his own did not receive him. Many times we pray, we yearn for stuff, we beg God for things, and the answer comes, but we are not even able to identify the answer because we don't even know what we want. The reason is because we have carved a niche that has several patterns of what we think should be answered to our prayers. We have a description of our ideal Messiah we have a template for our, our ideal answer or the ideal response that we expect to get from God. And in as much as these templates exist, whatever falls out of them cannot be the answer to our prayers. One of such templates that the scribes and Pharisees had was that they thought the Messiah could not be somebody that they know or was still a commoner. They even described him as a carpenter's son, Joseph's son. So for all they knew, this could not be the Messiah they are expecting or they are waiting for. In the same way, many of us have disregarded those that the Lord sent to us because we thought we knew them too well or because we thought they are too young or because we thought they are not qualified. This also explains why many people who could do better in political offices are all too often not voted for. Because usually many of them come to us as too young or inexperienced. But in very rare occasions when some of these people find their way into political office, they do very well. They come with that vibrancy of youthfulness and they come with those innovations of theirs and before you know it, we are happy we had them in power. But the ones we say have experience and they are full of years and they are old, these ones most of the time, they end up as despots or as tyrants, or at best, as dictators who impose themselves on us and want to remain in power forever. So we should be willing and ready to follow the guidance of the Lord. That's why in the responsorial time, we reminded ourselves that the Lord is the light of the world. So it requires that we follow where the light is leading, and Christ is our light. So for us to be able to submit to the guidance of the light of the Lord, we must first recognize that we are in darkness. We don't know it. The major obstacle we have to the guidance of the Lord is not that that guidance is not there. It is simply because we don't recognize that we are in need of it. Most times, the times that we think we see the clearest are indeed the times that we are most blind. Blinded as we are, by the illusions of our own convictions, by the illusions of our own learning, 
by the illusions of our own security. That's why St. Paul, in the first reading, tells the Corinthians, don't allow what you think you know blind you from truly knowing. So when he was criticizing philosophy, it was from that perspective. Because philosophers, as we know, who claim to be lovers of wisdom are people who really, for the most part, believe that they know it all. So it's very difficult to instruct a philosopher. I know he's even talking to us. A philosopher per excellence, Paul himself. He presents himself as though he knows nothing. But this man is a seasoned lawyer and a scholar in scripture. At this point, he's known as one who is versed in learning back and forth. So if he's coming to you and telling you there's so much you don't know, aside all you think you know, then listen. When we think we know too much, that itself is obstacle to knowledge. We must empty ourselves and let the Lord fill us in with sublime wisdom. And then we recognize that science is not enough to grant wisdom. Philosophy is not enough to grant wisdom. Experience is not enough to grant wisdom. Even old age is not enough to grant wisdom. To grant wisdom, we need access to sublime wisdom. And that has to happen through the commingling of the Lord's sublime wisdom with us. When wisdom tends within us, when wisdom is dwelling within us, then what comes out of us becomes wisdom indeed. And that's why wisdom came to dwell among us. In John chapter 1 verse 14, we are told he took flesh and dwelt among us. And when we allow ourselves to live in this tent of divine wisdom, then it will not be us speaking, it will be him speaking through us. That's what the scripture says, it is not you who speak, but the spirit of my father speaks in you. So that's why it's important for us to bend low and be humble, to allow ourselves to follow the guidance of divine wisdom, to follow the leadership of the Lord. And what the Lord wants from us is not as much as what he wants to give us. He only wants followership. Let us follow him so that we can have access to that which he wants to give us. So he's calling us to follow him. It's not because he wants to take anything from us, but because he really wants to give us. And that's why in that manifesto from Luke's gospel, he talked about everything he would give us. And you see that it's substantially an option for the poor. Something more important for us in this time more than ever. He addresses those who are downtrodden, those who are blind, those who are weak, those who are in prison. It takes nothing from us to listen and follow. Even if we think we know enough, but what we know hasn't taken us anywhere. It's important for us to listen again to the wisdom of the Lord and let him lead us to his promise. And this is exactly why the Lord gives the example of the widow of Zarephath and also Naaman the Syrian. What do these two individuals have in common? The leap of faith. That's what the Lord is asking us to make. When we think we don't have anything else that we can do for ourselves, the Lord tells us we can actually make that leap of faith. The widow of Zarephath had just little to live on, but she trusted that with the Lord, it could be replenished. And so she handed it to the starving Elijah, and that became her miracle. The same thing with Naaman the Syrian. He was leprous, only for him to come to Elisha, who sends him to go and swim. I mean, <laughs> washing in a river? There are many more better rivers where I come from. Why would you send me here to come and swim in your river? But Gehazi, his servant, says, look, if he's asked you for something more difficult, wouldn't you have done it? All the more, he now asks you to do something simple. Go ahead and do that, a leap of faith. And all of that affected the transformation. When we are talking about leaps, we are not talking about a jump into the dark. Contrary to that, a leap is a jump out of the dark into the light. We must therefore recognize that we are currently in the dark. We need to leap out of the dark into the light. And Christ is that light waiting to receive us. And when we are in him, we find the way to him. Because in his light, we see light. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.